Well, thank you, Martha, and everybody, Phoebe, for um, bringing us together, and also for all of us who have soldiered on throughout the day yeah. to this moment. Typically, I would say, based on my own experience, conferences of this sort begin with theory, begin with intellectual knowledge, and then try to get around to translating that knowledge to some sort of lived social reality. This conference has switched that hierarchy or that methodology in ways that I have found very interesting today and that set the stage for my very brief contribution to the conversation, which really is in the form of two very broad sort of thematic questions. So the way that that typical methodology got inverted in this room today really, I think, can be described as having been conducted through the act of storytelling. We've heard many, many stories. Indeed, the word cloud sort of privileges that practice. And so I could not help, and those stories seemed to be very enlightening, illuminating, as I watched the reactions of the people in the room throughout the day. And so I could not help but return to the first thematic question, which is, we have all lived during the past, uh, I guess, 72 hours through a, a really unprecedented historic moment in this country's history, which is the oral arguments in these two um, queer rights cases. And if you've been paying attention, which I assume you have, to the coverage and to the reactions and to the, to the descriptions of those, of what has been termed by the, by the judges themselves as a sea change between, let's say, 10 years ago and today, between when Clinton signed the DOMA and today, We've heard over and over and over and over and over and over again that what has contributed to, if not defined, that sea change is the simple act of many, many people coming out to their friends and families, which is, as I kept on thinking today, the act of telling their stories to their friends, their families, their neighbors, their co-workers. And so I could not help but think, wow, so here we are, it seems as a culture, forming a consensus that this simple act that Harvey Milk had identified as a primary act of political action so long ago, or maybe not that long ago, really, depending on which frame you use. <laughs> um, and it has worked because the stories could be heard that is, the message of the stories were received. The non-queer people hearing the stories of the queer closet brought down the closet. We're told, we're being told. And so then I thought, and this is my question to us, my first thematic question, so why hasn't that worked with race? Knowledge production focused on racial equality has pioneered storytelling, at least in this country, over the last 30 years. Some of the saints, Pat Williams, known for pioneering this practice in the context of racial justice. So my first question is, why can this country as a culture hear these stories and not those? 
what is the difference culturally, politically, between race and sexuality that permits one kind of story to produce a sea change in less than half of a lifetime and manage to just not hear all these other stories that I would have to say are in some ways more central to the larger story of American nationhood than the stories of queer oppression. So why cannot, why can we not hear the primary story while we hear these other very compelling stories, stories that also, I don't want to suggest that, you know, one is better or more powerful than the other, but I'm just left with this very, with the sense of puzzlement. And it would be great to have some reflection and some knowledge produced, some theory produced. So this is going back to the switch point that I began with. So from these stories, from these experiences, what knowledge, what theory? What explains it and what theory can we produce through that insight? Um, the second thematic question is Also, uh, it also involves a juxtaposition of race and sexuality, which are the two sort of pillars, right? Race and sexuality, the conference is sort of framed around those two constructs. So, I guess the way I would ask the question is this. If stories, have produced the sea change in the queer context that we're being told about, what has been the role of theory, if any? And the juxtaposition there is that I think race theory has been a story that has been heard in this country. The theory story has been heard. The race story told through the form of theory has been heard. I don't mean that it has produced justice, but it's been heard. So I understand the role of theory in the struggle for social justice, for racial justice. I wonder what role has queer theory plays, played in the sea change that we have been told in relationship to the stories that we are told produced the sea change. So you see, these are sort of broad thematic questions. I don't have answers for them, but as I have listened today, charged with the task of trying to sort of tie a bow towards the end, a rainbow bow <laughs> towards the end of the day, I'm left to wonder I'm left with these ideas, not idly, but with, with, w with the hope that we can extract the lessons from these juxtapositions, themes, and questions to then inform the next round. So you've got these elements, stories, theory, race, sexuality. And if we're going to take the switch points metaphor to a next level, that is a level that incorporates all of the switch points discussed throughout the day, and given the shadow, not the shadow, but the moment that we're living in with the Supreme Court arguments and their reverberations throughout culture, what are the lessons? I'll, so I'll just stop there. I mean, I could go on, but just to be brief, so.